Well, hello everyone and welcome to our Sauanaga Science talk this afternoon. Sauanaga Science is our annual Halloween inspired mini festival by researchers at Dias. This is the fourth year of the festival and every year we bring together researchers from each of the Dias disciplines, Celtic studies, theoretical physics and cosmic physics, which includes both astrophysics and ourselves geophysics. We have a series of free events to mark the ancient feast of Sauan, which is the basis of modern day Halloween. And this year's theme is exploring the dark side of science and Celtic heritage. You can find the full programme on dias.ie forward slash Sauanaga science. So our talk this afternoon is Hecla Volcano, the gateway to hell. Dr. Martin Mulhoff from Dias Geophysics will explain why Hecla is to this day frequently referred to as the gateway to hell. He'll be discussing its volcanic activity since the settlement of Iceland and putting that into context with more recent activity during the last hundred years. He'll also be looking at how Dias is contributing to understanding Hecla's activity and how hellish fieldwork on the volcano can sometimes be. A few housekeeping points before we start. Could everyone please ensure that you're on mute during the talk to minimize disruptions? If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box during the talk and Martin will answer it at the end. And if you're a Twitter user, please feel free to tweet about today's talk using our hashtag Dias Discovers. So I'll hand you over to Martin now, and I hope you enjoy our talk. Hi there. Yeah, thanks a lot, Claudia, for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to start by sharing my screen. So you should see now my first slide, but I will also have to share the sound because um, I will have some videos, so sorry for the small delay, but I think this is now fine. Okay, so uh, thanks for joining everyone. Uh, Hecla, a gateway to hell. So, um, of course, this expression has to do with the volcanic activity of Hecla. Uh, and therefore, I will start by uh, reviewing um, for you <clears throat> its, its activities since settlement, since the settlement of Iceland. Um, and also explain what kind of volcano Hecla actually is. And then we'll move on to a more recent activity at Hecla uh, over the last 100 years because there is more detail known about it and there's some interesting video footage from the 1947 eruption that I will show you. And after that, uh, I'll touch on the research we're doing on Hecla and what the fieldwork looks like. So let's start um, with one of the oldest maps uh, of Iceland. Uh, this one was published in 1585 by Abraham Otelius, as uh, a Dutch Flemish um, geographer. Uh, a lot of detail on this map, uh, very amazing, frightening sea creatures there at the bottom. But if you concentrate uh, more onshore, you can see a lot of mountain chains um, all over Iceland really. And uh, looking closer, um, it becomes clear there's actually only one volcano uh, depicted, uh, as you probably know, there are loads of volcanoes in Iceland, and um, I think more than 13 volcanoes have been active uh, since settlement. Uh, but Hecla is the only one that's actually marked here uh, in the center, more or less. And that's quite interesting and already points to the fact that it's a very active and dangerous volcano. There's actually only one volcano in Iceland that erupted uh, more frequently than Hecla. Uh, since settlement and that's Grimsworth and it's not on this map uh, it's it's to the east of Hecla uh, there's a very large actually the largest ice cap in in Europe called Vatna Jokul and the volcano is right underneath that ice cap and um, probably uh, this hasn't been mapped um, because it was too difficult to access so Hecla is the main main volcano here so uh, when we zoom in uh, on on Hecla uh, depiction on that map uh, there's a Latin inscription which translates as Hecla, condemned to storms and snow, vomits stones under terrible noise. So uh, people must have been quite impressed by uh, what happens sometimes there. So what does happen there and how often? So let's have a look at the time evolution of the eruptions. So on the x-axis, you can see the year when uh, an eruption happened since the settlement. The settlement of Iceland uh, happened around nine, 900 after Christ. So the first eruption um, was in 1104. So the first 200 years when people settled uh, in Iceland, that there was no Hecla eruption. 
and then it erupted uh, until now about 23 times. So you can see the last four four eruptions there, 70, 80, 91, and 2000. They happen kind of every 10 years, but um, please note that the x-axis here is not linear. So uh, the previous eruption, sometimes uh, Heckler was quiet for more than 100 years. Um, on the y-axis, so these bars show how intense each eruption was with respect to the ejected tephra and cubic kilometers. So the, the first eruption there in 1104 had two and a half cubic kilometers of tephra. What is tephra? Tephra is any solid material that's ejected into the atmosphere um, by a volcano. So anything solid. So for example, ash uh, uh, or volcanic bombs. Uh, ash is basically consisting um, out of particles that are smaller than say two millimeters and volcanic bombs uh, are, are pieces of matter that are larger than six centimeters. And anything in between is called cinder. So uh, all the solid material, uh, the estimate of how much uh, was ejected then um, is plotted here in this graph. And actually uh, its quantity then is used um, at volcanoes uh, to, to come up with a scale for the eruption magnitude and it's called the volcanic explosivity index. So only uh, the 1104 eruption uh, reached over into uh, five, so had an index of five. And there were like six or seven then uh, with index four. So the last one was index four was a 1947 eruption, a, a pretty large eruption in itself actually. And that's the one um, from which we have video footage and I will show it later. And that kind of can give an impression of what it might have been like in 1104, where 10 times more material was ejected. So this eruption was very significant. And um, the famous Icelandic geologist, archaeologist, uh, Tora Rinsen, uh, he wrote many um, papers and a book about Heckler. <clears throat> and he has witnessed um, the, the large eruption and also then the 70 eruption. He wrote horrific tales about Hegla began to circulate throughout the Catholic world. There, said people, was to be found the gateway to hell, if not hell itself. So this was so impressive that, uh, you know, the, the news about the eruption in 1104 spread, uh, not only through Iceland, of course, uh, but um, through whole of Europe and in some places in, in Northern Europe and, and uh, Great Britain, there was ash coming down and from, from the ash cloud of the eruption. And people were wondering what's that and then the reports came uh, what actually happened and uh, the catholic world was considering this to be the gateway uh, or one of the gateways to hell and this was then um, you know Hitler was referred as such up to the 19th uh, century and um, nowadays you can still hear about it in say tourist brochures and people still refer to it that, that it was called like this so um where is Hekla actually located? So this is a more modern map of, of Iceland and uh, Hekla is here in the southwest. I hope you can see my mouse cursor there. There's a big arrow pointing to the volcano location. Uh, the, the colors in this map, uh, so this white, uh, they're, they're um, ice caps or, or glaciers. And this is a, it's a, it's a large ice cap, very large. And um, the colors, the green, all areas that are green, uh, the, topography is between sea level and 200 meters and it's marked in green because uh, they are the areas where you know vegetation exists and some farming um, can be carried out uh, whereas then the the orangey brown areas there between 200 and 400 meters in elevation and that's quite marginal for farming you know a couple of sheep maybe and then if you go to the light green more inland uh, in our sense they call it the highlands uh, it's really kind of a desert, volcanic desert. It's black and there are craters and it looks a bit like on the moon and hardly anything grows there, a little bit of moss. So um, in this valley here to the north, um, uh, along the river Pjors, called Pjorsa, it is known that uh, during settlement, so before that big eruption from 900 to 1100, um, a lot of farms, people tried to, to settle there and it was a little bit warmer, not much warmer, a little, little, little bit milder than nowadays in Iceland uh, during settlement. And um, the remains of more than 20 farms were found in, in this valley. But the 1100 um, eruption, the, the ash cloud was so big and it went to, to, to the north and it, it covered everything there. And 
people never try to resettle that area again. Um, so what happens during an eruption? Uh, well, first we have to understand what type of volcano is Hecla. Hecla is quite a special volcano because it's a combination of two types. It's a combination of a stratovolcano and a fissure vent. That's very rare. I think there's only one other uh, mountain with that characteristic um, in South America. So a stratovolcano is built up by many layers, as you can see in the sketch to the left there, uh, of hard lava and tephra. So every time there's an eruption, the, the volcano grows, and it usually has this conical classic volcano shape. The fissure vent is something completely different. Um, they, the fissure vents basically um, exist uh, in, uh, in places where you have parallel fissures, except for example, in the in region of rift zones in the earth, and where basically really the, the crust opens up and then uh, along these fissures, um, magma can come up and then is ejected in, in fairly high lava fountains, sometimes hundreds of meters high. Um, and that's an official event. And uh, there are several craters then that, that are built in a row usually, and it looks very different than to a stratovolcano. And Heckler is both these things at the same time. As we can see, uh, no, we can't see it here. It's another plot then. But I just wanted to explain, I said these fissure zones, um, they usually uh, very often um, occur in, in the vicinity of rift zones. And of course, Iceland sits right on top of the uh, Atlantic Rift, as we all know. So the red line here is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Uh, so to the Northwest, to the left top in the graph, we have the American plate pulling to the Northwest. And then on, on the other side, there's the European plate. And um, basically these two plates are diverging. And uh, along the uh, North Atlantic Ridge, under the water, there is volcanic activity and new cross is being created. But Iceland is, is over the water, and that's uh, mainly due to the fact that it's uh, sitting over a hotspot. So a hotspot is, as you can see in the sketch here to the right, a region where uh, magma comes up uh, from further down um, and from the mantle and uh, comes through the crust to the surface. Uh, for example, this is also the case in Hawaii and in the Galapagos and many other places, but uh, usually it's not on a plate boundary, it's just somewhere inside a plate really. But in Iceland, the special case is it's actually right where the, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is. In the graph to the left, you can see these magenta stars and they are the positions, uh, the past positions of the hotspots and uh, hotspot. And at the moment, the hotspot sits right under the large ice cap uh, near Badabunga that erupted um, 2014. And Hecla sits here, um, the dashed line is a transform uh, zone and um, it sits right at the junction between that and um, this volcanic zone. And that's why um, it has the characteristics of both um, a fissure zone and uh, a fissure vent, sorry, and a stratovolcano. Um, so that's what it actually looks like. So when one looks at uh, Hecla from the Southwest along the fissure, then it looks like a classic stratovolcano here in the left picture. On the right, if you look at a right angle to the fissure, it looks quite different. It's a very longish kind of structure, which can also be seen in, in this aerial photo here. So this is Hecla proper, but then you see all these craters. Um, so that's a crater row and basically Hecla is at the moment, at least the biggest part of, uh, of it, the biggest surface expression. On the right, the map, you can see again Heckler there. And all the red lines, they're, they're the fissures that uh, were active and erupted in the past. So those in the darker magenta, magenta areas, um, they, they were active longer ago, more than a thousand years. Uh, but in the brighter area where we have the mountain at the moment, um, that's where, where the action usually happens uh, during the last one, 2000 years. And uh, the main fissure here, the main longer line uh, is called uh, Heck Lugia, sorry if I can't pronounce this correctly. Um, and uh, that's usually then when, when an eruption happens, this opens up along the whole length. It's about five kilometers, the whole length of the mountain. And that's what it looks like then uh, in these two photos from uh, on the left. Um, that's a um, photo from the 1980 eruption taken by Michael Dite. He's a photographer who was by coincidence at the mountain and then he saw suddenly he heard explosions 
and uh, the volcano became active and this photo is from fairly early on in the eruption you can see that um, lava is coming out in, in this kind of curtain fashion um, along the long fissure that crosses, goes along the length of, of Heckler. And you can see uh, the white part of the cloud is steam and the darker is where tephra solid material is ejected. And on the right, there's a, a, a aerial photo from a journalist of the Iceland Monitor of the 2000 eruption. So 2000 was the last eruption at Heckler. And because it's at night, you can see even better here yeah, the lava curtain, and then also the lava flowing down the, the flank of the mountain. So um, in the opening phase of an eruption, so this fissure opens up, and then there are very large explosions and volcanic bombs flying around, and usually a very high ash cloud. So in the 47 eruption, it was 30 kilometers high. Uh, so the troposphere, the part where the weather uh, exists, uh, is 10 kilometers. And that's at the tropopause interface to the stratosphere is where mo uh, most of the long distance air traffic happens. And in the higher uh, section of the atmosphere, um, it, it's quite important for climate. So if, if volcanic ash enters there, that can have a, a very you know, longer lasting effect uh, on the whole northern hemisphere in this case. Um, yeah, as I say, uh, it was nearly 30 kilometers and the exact height there of that eruption in 1947 uh, of 27 kilometers is known um, because uh, the, uh, this photo was taken from 120 kilometers away. So that's kind of the distance from Dublin to Wexford. Uh, so the photo was taken from near Reykjavik, the capital, and one can see this massive um, ash cloud. Um, this photo was taken one hour after the eruption started. And the eruption was so intense that it was heard all around Iceland, uh, up to 300 kilometers away from Hekla. And the lava bombs, the, the solid pieces of material that were ejected, uh, that lasted for five weeks. And they, they were found up to 50 kilometers from Hekla. For example, uh, 32 kilometers from Hekla, a 50 centimeter diameter or several uh, presumably uh, bombs were found of 20 kilograms and close on the flanks of, of Hekla up to one kilometer from the uh, main fissure, there were blocks found of the size of uh, 12 by four meters. So that's kind of the, the ground, the, yeah, it's kind of very large. Um, so the ash, ash in that case uh, was ejected for three months. And unfortunately the ash from Hecla is poisonous. There's a lot of uh, fluorine in it. And so when the ash comes down in the fields and sheep or other livestock eat it, they, they, they get poisoned or they get at least sick if and sometimes they die. And basically this enters the food chain and can actually also be a problem then for humans, <clears throat> unfortunately. Uh, another example there is, uh, or another uh, 50 centimeter thick ash was uh, around Heckler up to seven kilometers found. And that's a problem of course for buildings that might not be able to sustain that and the ash was also found in um, Northern Europe. So, um, okay, so as I mentioned to you, I have some video footage of, uh, it's fairly dramatic actually, uh, of the 47 eruption, but it's not from the very beginning of the eruption because that was so, so severe, uh, no one could be uh, close to it at all. But three or four weeks after the, uh, I think two or three weeks after the eruption, started, uh, it, it restarted again with explosive activity, which wasn't as intense as in the beginning, but uh, you will see in the video, it's still pretty rough. Yeah, um, well, seeing these uh, pictures, I have to say, uh, I don't think this was really safe and it wasn't safe uh, for the scientists. At least they were wearing helmets, but um, this is so close. Um, this is probably not what should happen, but they did it, I think, because 
you know, this was the first eruption after about 100 years, I think, and it was the first time this could be documented with, with uh, cameras and filming it. Uh, I have another uh, clip here where you can see uh, bombs flying. <laughs> Several craters opened in the southwestern section of the eruption fissure during the later part of April, and these were very active. Yeah, it's really hard to believe how close uh, they went. Um, this is not safe. Um, so, okay, that's um, the lava, uh, the, sorry, the, 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 the explosions and the bombs flying out. And then, uh, of, of course, also usually lava is produced and that can take much longer. So in the 47 eruption uh, lasted for 13 months until the end of the eruption, basically. Um, so the lava front were up to 50 meters high, uh, up to eight kilometers from Heckler and covered 40 square kilometers. And at the deepest section, the lava was uh, 100 meters deep. So this is very large, uh, huge amounts of lava. And again, I have, I have a clip there about the lava flow in Heckler and uh, pay attention also to the music. It's quite interesting. The music um, is supposed to be uh, frightening and strange, uh, composed by John Lars, uh, an Icelandic componist who, who produced this piece called Heckler. And I, I, of course, can't play all of this or more of this, but when it goes to, uh, to explosions and so on, there's a huge uh, amount of noise uh, and, uh, you know, rock anvils have to be, to be used and metal pipes and 19 percussionists. And also the orchestra is supposed to be split into two groups. It's very, very complicated. And this piece was only ever performed twice, as far as I know. Um, one last uh, video of, of this is then actually, you can see here the lava flowing down the flank of the mountain. But then when it goes into the lower uh, regions around uh, Heckler, in this case, uh, it slows down, of course, and then it builds uh, these lava fields. And there's now video footage of the lava front. And it looks, of course, uh, it looks very different. From the eastern part of the Heckler fissure, stopped in less than a week from the beginning of the eruption. But the flow from the southwestern end continued without a pause, rolling down the slopes on that side. Yeah, I showed you this because of, it looks quite different to the, the fluid lava flow we've seen before, uh, but this is typical. So when the la lava slows down, it starts to cool. So on the surface, you cannot see uh, in this picture, you know, uh, it turns black because it's cooled down. And you can also hear how it, it sounds like breaking glass, how these blocks then break and tumble. And that's basically then what's left over. Um, and this, I, I show you this because this matters for our field work. We have sometimes to to uh, cross cool down uh, such cooled down lava flows when uh, it's very tough um, and, and sharp material that breaks easily and so on. Okay, so um, that's this part. Now I want to talk a bit what, what 
are we doing? Why are we interested into HECLA? Well, we're interested into volcanoes in general. So there's a volcano seismology group at um, Dias Geophysics. And um, we're interested into the fundamental understanding of volcanoes uh, using seismic data. So on the right, there's a couple of examples of what kind of seismic signals are sometimes detected in volcanoes. The top one is a classic earthquake, uh, but you can see that the signals below look quite different, or even at the bottom there, the one uh, we call tr uh, tremor, this kind of signal if when it's more continuous. And um, so that because these are caused by different processes, one can learn a lot uh, by looking at the seismic signals um, from a volcano. And we do then uh, do quite a bit of numerical simulations. And uh, more recently in the last few years, uh, field campaigns, I listed a few here. And the first few were actually carried out while the research group was still in UCD. And then the head of section in Dias Geophysics, Chris Bean, he was previously at UCD and moved with his research group in 2015, uh, including me, uh, to Dias. And the last two, there are Galapagos, and then also some of the Iceland, Fadagel, Seattle, and Heckler. Uh, projects uh, were carried out the field work while we were in Dias. Fagradal Seattle is um, the volcano that erupted um, near Reykjavik earlier this year uh, and is actually quiet since a few weeks so the eruption lasted uh, half a year but it's not really known whether it's completely stopped. But Hekla, um, so why actually Hekla? Well we're interested, uh, well, it's most active and dangerous volcano in Iceland, so that makes it interesting. And it's actually a little bit understudied, uh, we believe, so that makes it really interesting. The last eruptions, as I mentioned earlier, happened in 47, the large one, and then somewhat smaller ones in 70, 80, 91, and 2000. So kind of nearly every 10 years, as you can see in the, the graph here to the right, which shows the interruption interval. And you can see that actually maybe that's not so typical every 10 years. Uh, earlier since settlement, um, the, no, the interval was between 20 and 120 years. Uh, it's, it's, it's not regular. So it's quite, quite interesting that it was regular and of the last century, but um, it didn't erupt since 2000. So um, it didn't erupt now for 21 years and it remains to be seen when, when it becomes active again. Um, Hekla is also of interest, or actually any volcano in Iceland, uh, to, uh, to us here in Ireland, because it's not that far. It's only 1,400 kilometers from Dublin. That's the same distance like uh, Madrid or Munich from Dublin. It's not far. And probably some or most of you remember the 2010 closure of air, uh, airspace in Europe because of the Icelandic volcano Eyjafjallajökull jokul uh, that erupted in April 2010. And you can see in the right map uh, that a uh, few days later, on the 18th of April, all the countries uh, marked here in red, they had their airspace completely closed, some for up to two weeks. I think it was two weeks here in Ireland. So that is a very significant thing. Uh, orange means those countries had a partial uh, closure of airspace. And green, as that means, it didn't have to close at all its airspace because uh, here in the other map on the left, you can see that the cloud drifted off to the south towards Europe and Iceland itself actually wasn't directly affected, at least not its um, airspace. Um, also another example why this can be quite important is uh, it's known that the eruption 3000 years ago, so there was a really large one, it was uh, bordering on ind uh, index six, six, a cool temperature for several years in the Northern hemisphere. And uh, a st study uh, of tree ring growth in Ireland of oak, um, found in, in Irish box showed that there, there, there wasn't hardly any growth for, for up to 10 years. So this can have a really strong impact uh, on us here. Um, so yeah, the project we are carrying out on HECLA, we call it first, uh, it stands for HECLA Real-Time Seismic Network. And we got funding in 2017, 18 uh, from the Geological Survey here in Ireland. And then later in 2020 and 21 uh, from a European project, a EU funded project called Eurowalk. And we carry out uh, all this work in collaboration with the Icelandic Met Office, IMO. They, um, they operate the National Seismic Network in Iceland. Um, so the main goals of HERSC are to improve the pre eruption warning time. It's uh, well, currently, well, the last two eruptions. The first seismic signals were discovered only one and one and a half hours before the eruption started. And uh, because of this, there is this warning sign 
uh, next to Heckler for people who intend to hike up uh, to have a look. And it explains uh, what the dangers are and that one should have mobile phones switched on so that one can receive emergency calls if needs be. And also what the escape routes would be depending on where one is on the volcano. Um, so we, we want to improve this by adding more stations and closer to the volcano and also scientifically to better understand the processes that drive the seismicity, the pre-eruptive seismicity. So the seismicity that happens just before the eruption. And also ideally would like to monitor a fissure eruption close up because that's very rarely done. But to do that, um, we have to transfer the data in real time because the equipment would be clearly uh, would be destroyed if this big fissure opens up and all hell breaks loose. Uh, but if you transmit the data in real time through uh, mobile technology, mobile uh, modems, then we would have data up to the last second before the equipment gets destroyed. We would have an absolute unique uh, data set. So that's also one goal of, of all this. Um, so yeah, to do all this, uh, we need seismometers directly uh, on the volcano, uh, which is very difficult to achieve. So on this map, you can see uh, the location of uh, the stations that we installed, these red triangles. Uh, here on, on, on the right top of the graph, you can see uh, the, the path, well, it's, a, it's a dirt track one can drive to the mountain and the blue triangles are pre-existing stations uh, from our Icelandic colleagues. So we use all these stations together now. Uh, I, I want to show you some um, uh, seismic data a little bit, not too much, just uh, this and the next graph. So in, in this uh, graph here, uh, you can see for each uh, of, of those stations, the seismogram recorded after, um, after an earthquake in 2018, uh, magnitude one, Point one, uh, which was happening inside the volcano. And the f uh, so what you see in each panel is the data for one station. So on the x-axis is time, uh, 15 seconds long. And on the y-axis is just how strong did the, did the ground shake. And um, you can see that uh, after one to two seconds, the, the first arrival, the first shaking arrived. So you know from these time arrivals, uh, I mark them here in orange, uh, one can then estimate where was the event. Uh, the top four panels are from our new stations. So I marked them in red here, Hearst stations. And the blue ones are those that are around the volcano, not on the volcano. And you can see um, it took a little bit longer, of course, for the seismic wave to arrive at uh, each seismometer. Another example of an, a much smaller event uh, here to the right now. And here you can see that if you focus to the three um, panels at the, at the bottom, uh, that uh, the stations around the volcano, at least two of them didn't see the event at all, and the other one only very weakly. So in this case, uh, we wouldn't know about the event if we wouldn't have added our stations. So the idea is there that we will be able to pick up much smaller events and therefore hopefully um, be able to get an earlier warning time. But also recording all these, uh, there are loads of these events, and uh, it turns out, um, um, one, one can learn a lot about the volcano and its internal structure. So if you think about it, to, to locate an event, for, for example, here, as an example, I've given uh, an earthquake that happened on the southern flank uh, of, of um, Hekla. And uh, the, the distance to, to each station determines how long it takes to, to, uh, for the seismic wave to arrive. So one can, by triangulation, figure out where the station is. But to do that, one needs to know how fast or slow does the seismic wave travel from, from the epicenter where the earthquake happened to each station. And we don't really know this. Uh, you know, Hekla is not that well studied. But by um, taking a lot of data from a lot of earthquakes that we detected, one can run an inversion and do calculations. And my colleague Mason Reservoir um, uh, did this work for us, um, and then one gets this profile. The red line is the resulting 1D velocity profile, which tells us at what depths we uh, expect what kind of um, velocity for seismic waves. One can do, uh, push this even further, and then this is a 1D thing. I do this in 3D and do tomography. It's a, uh, so you see these two sections there on the right, and they're like horizontal slices through the mountain. Uh, and uh, by doing this in more detail, we'll be able to study what, what is happening in uh, 
what does look like inside um, Heckler because there are pre uh, previous studies that only very roughly uh, estimate uh, where and how deep the magma chamber is and they don't give um, results that agree with each other. So getting more uh, information will be very interesting. This is all preliminary work. We need more data and more time to work on the data. So this tomography is a little bit like in hospital, not like x-ray where one can really see all the details. It's more like fuzzy uh, ultrasound images. So uh, I leave it at that from the science, uh, but I wanted to show you as well um, what the field work looks like. Uh, so here a photo of what Hekla looks like in good weather conditions. Uh, Iceland is, has very changeable weather. It's, it's a lot worse than, than Ireland. It rains a lot, it's very windy. So, but if it's a good day like this, usually nearly always there's still a cloud on top of Hekla. And that's actually why it's called Hekla. Hekla stands for Hulet Cape in Icelandic. So um, yeah, one, of course, to go up, uh, one needs reasonable weather. So we always wait until at least it's not too windy and stormy and so on. But as I say, often there's still this cloud. And once one go, enters this cloud, it's a little bit like winter because on top, the, the mountain is like 1500 meters high. It's, it's hardly ever much over zero degrees. So here are a couple of photos. So it's often very wet and freezing. A small video here of my colleague, David Craig, uh, walking up there early in September when we did field work together on Hegler. Yeah, it, he's just strolling along there, but actually he's carrying 35 kilograms of large car batteries. So there's often heavy lifting involved. And also you could see uh, we were walking there along this lava field where I mentioned earlier, and it's very sharp rock uh, that when you, it crumbles when you walk over it. And so um, the trick is always to try to avoid it as much as possible and go around these lava fields. But in some places you have to cross them at some stage and it wrecks your shoes and reindeer and everything. Yeah, we keep replacing all this uh, quite frequently. Uh, here, another of my colleagues from the British Geological Survey, who joined me in previous years, Heiko Buxo, and we try sometimes then to, to get cover on uh, plastic sheets, but it's quite tricky then to work on electronics in cold, wet conditions. Often it's very loud as well, as you, you will be able to notice on this small video uh, on top of Heckler. So we yeah, are uh, even communicating with each other is sometimes uh, quite tricky um, in, in these weather conditions. But fortunately, sometimes the weather is also, um, it can be quite nice. It's rare, but it happens. Uh, like in this instance here on the left top, um, actually there was uh, quite a bit of snow very suddenly overnight and we couldn't drive with our Jeep as far as usual. So we had to hike much further, but fortunately the snow had a very good condition and made it actually easier to walk over those lava fields. Um, yeah, and here in the middle photo on the, on the bottom, you can see the newer hut. There's a hut on, on the summit uh, by the Icelandic Met office. They use that for gas measurements. Uh, there's an instrument in there that measures how much gas seeps out of Heckler and the hope is to detect uh, any change there before the next eruption. And uh, this summer we actually migrated some of our electronics into that hut as well, which, which was nice. Um, and then I wanna show you actually this video. Uh, that's still the hut that was there um, two years earlier. It's the older version of the hut, but this video is really good. Uh, it was very good weather on that day to show you what it's like there on, on top. So you can see that in this case here on the summit, there's no snow cover because the ground's actually really warm uh, because of the volcanic geothermal um, activity. There in the background, you could see the West Manor Islands and here under the clouds um, is Eya Fatla Jokl, the volcano that uh, erupted in 2010. That's me there and in these blue bins. So we dig a hole and then um, install our seismometers in, in the blue bins at the base, uh, there we use a concrete, uh, small concrete base uh, to have a solid ground coupling uh, there. That's the GPS antenna. So all seismic stations <clears throat> need a GPS antenna, not for the location, but to give very precise time stamping. That's very important for seismic data. In the background there, you can see a crater row also related to, to Heckler, uh, the Heckler Fisher system. And here on the right at the bottom, you can see a cable. And that cable 
is actually one kilometer long and runs over that next hill down um, for nearly 1,000 meters to, to a second station, uh, where we also have a wind charger to generate uh, power to run all the equipment and then send, sending the data here in internet mode takes actually quite a lot of power. And there's also then on the mast uh, solar panel, so that's quite useful in summer when there's sometimes less wind. So we have three such pairs where we have, so we have three points where we generate power at these red triangles on the map and also have a seismometer. And then they are linked via one kilometer heavy cables to uh, the locations marked with black triangles here. And there's then uh, another seismometer and that's how we operate our six seismometers. On top of Heckler, you can see the seismometer here inside the blue bin and some associated electronics. Um, yeah, we found that especially on top of Heckler, it's quite difficult or actually impossible to operate a uh, wind turbine. And you can see on the left panel, uh, after we installed it the first time, and then a day later, there was a bit of snow ice on it. And three days later, it was already frozen in and it couldn't turn. Uh, and our colleagues from IMO, they went up uh, six months later during winter uh, and found this very big ice structure. and the the wind charger is actually inside this. It's totally, it was totally frozen in. And when all this um, ice disappeared in the next summer, the, the wind charger actually didn't work. But uh, the solar panel was still there and uh, kickstarted our equipment. But it's a bit small, it's not enough. And we now know we'll, we can't rely on wind there. We'll, we'll add more solar and a bigger battery bank. And then our colleagues from the IMO, they have these ski doos. And in winter, they can drive up all the way um, to the top of Heckler and they can recharge batteries with, with um, a generator. Uh, this photo was taken at the initial deployment when they pulled up all the gear. Um, then there's one place, uh, one station where they can drive up with their super Jeep there. And they also have, sometimes we can use some quad bikes or they're actually six wheelers. But generally, uh, yeah, they do that sometimes and in some place, but um, most of the stations one can only visit by foot. So we have to do a lot of hiking. There's a GPS uh, trail. Um, that's one of the last things I'm, I'm gonna show you today uh, of, of a typical hike where we went up there to the summit and then to the next station and back. Um, certainly a good way to stay fit. Um, and I, I will leave it at that for now and I'm happy to answer any questions if, if there are any. Thank you. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Martin, for the talk. Um, we have a couple of questions for you here. Uh, the first one is from James Merle. He'd like to ask, how does the risk from Lackey compared to Hecla? The Lackey eruption in 1783 probably killed more people due to SO2 emission than Hecla. Yeah, Laki is one of the biggest eruptions uh, in the worldwide. Actually, it's, I think uh, it's the largest lava uh, produced uh, worldwide uh, since the last two thousand years. So that had a massive effect. Uh, that's true. Um, also, there was also uh, poisonous gas coming out from this lava field. It's, uh, no comparison to Hecla, it was much much bigger. And uh, you know, some people say it. it Changed the climate in, in parts of Europe, uh, on the mainland of Europe, even, uh, and might have contributed to, to the French Revolution, partly at least in the end, because people were starving, literally. And that uh, partly is due to Larky, uh, at least that's claimed by some scientists. So um, it's quite a different scenario. So the Larky is uh, that, that was a very long fissure that opened up. So it was a fissure eruption, uh, and it's located east of Hecla, uh, closer to the large ice cap. And we have another question here from John Merle. Would you get more useful information from ground res resistivity measurements as was done in La Palma looking for geothermal energy? Uh, more information about, uh, the, yeah, it depends on what, about what, you know. So if we look at trying to get early warning, then uh, seismics is probably a really good one because once stuff starts, the magma starts to move and it, it opens up new pathways. Yeah, one can see that in, in, in seismic data. But um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of geothermal exploration going on in Iceland. Um, they have some of the biggest sites in, in the world. 
uh, but not near Hector, uh, further west towards Reykjavik. Uh, so our next question here is from Owen Carly. He says, you showed a figure of an eruption size in units of kilometers cubed dating back to the 12th century. How is the eruption size estimated this far back in time? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, well, basically, uh, there, there are people who study, the geologists who study the thickness of the ash layers. So in field work, they go around and dig in the ground, or when you look at some places where you can see um, the different ash layers, you can measure how thick the ash is. And then you also go around and, and estimate how big the, the field is. And this way, you can then calculate the volume. And um, actually, the, the, the geo the geochemical uh, fingerprint of the ash is slightly different for different eruptions, uh, plus also, of course, the thickness. And um, one of the, uh, the Icelandic, uh, his name is Tora Rinsen, he developed the uh, tephrochronology uh, technique where you can use these layers then to date other things like archaeological sites and so on. But yeah, it's, it's actually possible at least for, you know, you can't really do this for eruptions that happened much, much longer ago because you still have to be able to access uh, these layers by digging or um, so on. I hope that answers it more or less. Um, and if there's any other questions anyone has, uh, please put them in the Q&A section. Just leave uh, another moment for uh, anyone to ask any last minute questions. One more. Uh, so what is the rationale for the actual locations chosen for your new seismometer stations? They seem to be in an arrowhead formation. Is this just because they, fo they follow easy access to ridges or is it beneficial for the triangulation? I like this question. Very good. Well observed. Um, no, it's, it's not a design. Uh, so normally a network, you, you don't really want stations in a line you want them more covering an area and it's basically just that especially the west and the south of Hecla is simply not accessible unless you have a helicopter but the thing is you have to go back to the station so even if you would get a helicopter to put it into a really inaccessible place so they're inaccessible because they're very large lava fields and actually this summer you try to fill one of these gaps and I went with Dave by foot and you know you, it takes like hours to cross these lava fields and actually also it's you know you have to be quite careful and so basically the shape is uh, due to where we could put them and it's not the ideal shape for a seismic network. Okay and we have one more question um, I think related to uh, what you were saying about how the ground is warmed by uh, the geothermal at the top of Hecla. Yeah. Susan would like to know, can you boil an egg if you bury it at the top of Hecla? Oh, that's <laughs> that's a good idea. I think I should try that out. <clears throat> so I, I only digged um, like a little bit just for fun. That, well, we did for the seismometer, but we actually went a little bit 20, 50 meters away from the hotspot there because we didn't want it too hot for the seismometer and usually that's it's corrosive then as well uh, but like close to the hut where they do the gas measurements if you dig like 30 40 centimeters it's really warm too hot i believe yeah if you would dig deeper you probably could and maybe i should try that next time your next lunch break on field work. yeah it's an excellent <laughs> idea okay i think that's all of our questions now so thanks again martin for uh, for the talk just before everyone goes I'd just like to share something with you. So this is, so this is uh, creating our future. So this is a new government initiative. And the idea of it is to get some input from the Irish public about what sort of questions we'd like to see done. So it's a bit of a, a drive to know about what sort of questions about the world we want to see answered. Um, so if there was anything in the talk today that sparked a little bit of curiosity, uh, I'd really encourage you to log on to creatingourfuture.ie and proposing it as a potential research topic, because it's going to be really important in shaping the research in Ireland over the next few years.